The tendency that people want to put you on a pedestal, and we just have to constantly say, I'm sorry, I'm just not going to do that. I'm getting down to where you are, and let's follow Jesus together. We've had hard times, you know, we've had to learn how to confront and be quick to resolve conflict. Don't let it linger. You know, it's interesting. We need the blood of Jesus that cleanses us and that clean, cleanses the atmosphere of ministry and the atmosphere of church. But in 1 John 1, 7, it says, as we walk in the, in the light, as he's in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Well, the blood doesn't work in the dark. Only as we just trust the light, say, hey, let's just talk about this, what we still be clean is, what's going on? And in the light, well, we find out things, boy, you can't look wrong, but the blood cleanses. And we have fellowship with one another in it. We want to help you be the very best missionary so that you can give your very best to the people you're serving. What makes this podcast unique is it's done by missionaries for missionaries. How can we take timeless principles and apply them to our lives as missionaries? That's really our heart behind this. Welcome to this episode of the Modern Day Missionaries Podcast. What a delight to welcome Andrew McMillan to the podcast today. Welcome, Andrew. Hey, it's exciting to be here. And, and you know, I just felt almost Spanish come up. I bet most missionaries, when they go back to the state or, or they're on some sort of Zoom, their Spanish or their foreign language comes up almost automatically. So you have to repress it. But I'm from West Virginia, and that accent will never leave me. There you go. And you know, if you flip into Spanish, I can roll with you, Andrew. We'll just put some subtitles for our <laughs> for our non-Spanish speakers. We're good. And let me just let everybody know a little bit who you are. So Andrew was the founding pastor of the church Comunidad in Medellin, Colombia. And Andrew received his Master of Divinity from Yale Divinity School in 1980. I heard one of your professors was Henry Nowen. I just have to insert that yes. right in the middle of the introduction because he's my favorite author. I'm, Yeah, we'll have to talk more about yeah. that later. He, he one time said, no, no, Andrew, you're not so bad for an evangelical. I love that. I'm picking your brain on some, some of those stories later on. It's going to be hard to stay on topic knowing that fun fact about you. So, okay, I'll, I'll keep going. So, Andrew um, pastored a Baptist church in New Jersey for six years before being supernaturally called to Columbia in 1986 and then married his wife, Kathy. And when they planted the church in Medellin in 1994, Medellin was the least churched city in the hemisphere and number one in murders and kidnappings. And not long ago, Kathy and Andrew turned the lead pastorate over to Juangi and Lily Ricaurte. Am I saying that right? Perfect. All right. And they also pastor the Colombian soccer team, uh, that couple, which is so fun as well. And the church has 7,500 7, people in attendance every weekend with 700 home groups. And that McMillan's current focus is church planting and bringing the Father's heart to the city. So what an incredible legacy you guys have and continue to walk out in Colombia. And one of the things uh, I think where we'd really like to put our focus today in talking to you, Andrew, as somebody who's been in ministry for a long time and is still in ministry and is walking it out in a healthy way is looking at being healthy leaders and creating a culture of healthy leadership. You and I were talking briefly before we got started. There is so much scandal just rocking the church in general right now. And so when, when we can find leaders who've been in it for the long haul, who are doing it well, I just want to learn from people like you. I really do. So I'd love for you just to even share a little bit about some of what you've seen and, and um, what healthy leadership is to you. How would you define that? I'd say, well, first of all, you, we can't have any real authority unless we have a Holy Spirit love for the people and for the geographical area. And we have to have such a love we're willing to plan ourselves, die where God's sending us. 
uh, because you see Jesus looking at the multitude who moved by compassion. It means that his guts were ripped up on the inside and he healed the sick. But so there's no real authority unless there's a love, a love to serve and not to control. Uh, I think, you know, 30, 40 years ago, um, pastors who were called by God, loved Jesus, but they had a lot of their personal ambition and control issues involved, and they got away with it. Uh, I mean, the church is still grow, well, it grew. Well, they didn't really get away with it because they were miserable. They're worn out. They didn't enter into the rest of the Lord, and they're always worried about their how they appeared, and they really didn't have much fun. Uh, but also today, this new generation is just when they smell a little bit of uh, somebody trying to control them and take the place of the Holy Spirit, they run for the hills. Um, you know, I was just uh, with uh, the, the presidents of the Pastors Association in this whole area. And we had them for breakfast in our church not long ago. And I said, you know, there's a lot of um, controlling pastors that are killing their congregations and killing their own life. And they're really impeding the growth of the church. And and I, so we looked at Judges 9. And that's an amazing story. I'll just do this quickly. And Judges 9, or oh, what was that? Jerusalem. It was the son of Gideon. And he was the only one left that his older brother didn't kill. He killed about 50 of, the, of his brothers, and he took control. And um, so he got up, and they, he, he shouted out a parable. He said, all the trees were looking for a leader, and people are really looking for, you know, shepherds after Jesus' heart. And, um, and so he cried out to the... Um, Olive tree, come and reign over us. And the olive tree says, no, 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 I'm not going to leave my oil and my anointing that refreshes God and man. Now, there's something. We, first, we minister to the Lord. Then we minister to the people. Or else we'll just be exhausted. Um, and then he said, but I don't want to take away my oil that is to refresh God and man and just to go sway over you guys. And so... They went to the next guy, who was the fig tree, says, I'm not going to leave my sweetness uh, just to be a big shot over you all. And then they went to the vine, and the, and the vine said, I'm not going to leave my, my wine of joy that it, that it um, gladdens God's heart, there again, and man's heart, just to be a leader over you. And so they, th those three characteristics of leadership to opt it out then who stood up the thorn tree mm -hmm. oh i'll i'll lead over you i'll give you my covering and it's interesting the thorn tree doesn't even have a shade and there's all this movement of people this i call them the amway apostles they're coming in they're trying to give you know covering to churches and and all they're trying to do is just get their tithe and then and then he said uh, and if you don't accept my leadership, fire's going to come out from my thorns and burn you I mean, with threats, with threats, with uh, intimidating leadership. And that's what will happen if we don't fill the vacuum with leaders. Um, you haven't heard these three characteristics in the leadership book that have um, sweetness and uh, refreshment and joy. So I, I think one of our things, and we're mm. talking with our pastors all the time about this, we just want to create an atmosphere where the Word of God can really speak to people and the Holy Spirit can do the work. And we don't want to take the place of the Holy Spirit and try to force people. And we've learned over the years, because we've been involved with um, uh, you know, having people almost in church every night you know, for a while, and we quit that. We begin to see no that we got to have, got to give time so people can be Christians. I talked to one pastor. I said, "Why do you have a services every night? Well, if I don't keep them in the church, they're going to go back into the world." <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> there is no confidence in the work of the Holy Spirit in the people. 
So anyways, that's, that's one thing. That's Eight. huge. No confidence in the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Yeah. That is a powerful statement that you just said right now, because if we are not training people to hear the Holy Spirit for themselves, then what are we doing? We're taking the place of the Holy Spirit. I really appreciate, Andrew, that in talking about what healthy leadership is, you started out by talking about what it's not. I think that sometimes is where we have to begin, and it's not controlling. And so this is something you've seen a lot. Well, I, I've heard this example. This might free up some dear missionaries. I heard an example of um, sheep ranchers and cattle ranchers in Australia. And they have huge ranches of thousands and thousands of critters, but they don't build any fences. What they do is they just dig a well. And cows are not that bright, but they're not that dumb. They don't wander too far from where the water is flowing. And so I, I know there's times in my past, I was like a pastor. I was going around trying to repair the back door of the church, repair the fences so the sheep couldn't escape. And then, you know, when I was talk talking to people, I was worried, oh, they're going to leave the church. Well, I got free from that. And my only job is just to keep the the uh, the wells of the Holy Spirit flowing, the Word flowing, and uh, just do everything to teach people how to have a good relationship with God and a good relationship with one another. That is so good. Focus on the well instead of building all of the the fences. You know, I love that you brought up the sheep analogy too, because it makes me think of something I heard a pastor say a few weeks ago, and. It was some pastors trying to encourage each other because uh, they were feeling discouraged as pastors because it's so hard. And he goes, you know, an older pastor told me something that really helped me. He said, we're shepherds. And what do shepherds do? They take care of sheep. And what are sheep? Sheep are stupid. And a bunch of them started to laugh. And another one of the pastors said, hey, I think it's pretty good for us all to remember that we're sheep too. We're sheep too. <laughs> and the other guy got kind of a, we're sheep too. So if we're calling sheep stupid, then we're calling ourselves stupid. And here's the deal. If we forget that we're sheep, then we're forgetting that we need a shepherd, that we need Jesus as the shepherd, but also mentors and leaders in our lives. So when we create that separation, we are the shepherd and they are the sheep and we have to control them. Like you were saying, what does that produce? That's yeah. not a healthy leader. Dig the wells. Oh, that was so well, no, good. Also, that was so I, good. Yeah, you have to say, uh, I was even um, just sharing with some pastors in, in our uh, plant, church plant. Uh, Isaiah 50, I think it's the last verse 11. You don't walk in the in the light of your own um, fire. You know, here's the image. You're at night, you make a little force, you know, a little campfire. And the light that that campfire makes is our reasoning, our intellect, our power to think, to understand. And if we try to stay within our understanding, uh, we're really limiting. Well, we're, we're never going to experience the peace of, that passes understanding, and we're going to limit God to our understanding. So, I mean, I do believe that there is, needs to be the uh, the intellect that committed to the Holy Spirit. And and realize yeah. how dependent we are, but also not only, yeah, we 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 sheep are stupid. We really desperately need uh, Jesus, and you know the temptation is after you get so many years in the ministry, we start depending on our experience, and and that mm -hmm. will cut us off from from the well and from the light of the Spirit. But we got to understand the Holy Spirit, as it says in 1 Corinthians, Jesus in us is our wisdom, it's our sanctification, it's our justification. We have to honor the Holy Spirit in, pe in people. Uh, one of our philosophies that we started yes. years ago, I got this from um, E. Stanley Jones in his book, Ascension, uh, The Songs of Ascension, one of my favorite biographies. And he said, he has this very sick, Successful black pastor in Atlanta, Georgia. Why is your church growing with such joy and number? And he says, well, we just put a crown of gold about 10 inches above the people's head and watched them grow up into it. 
So we create that expectation. We see you as Christ sees you. And see, when people think that prophecy is to discover secret sin, everybody knows their secret sin. What prophecy needs to do is to show them the crown of gold and their destiny and where they can grow, who, whom they can grow into. Absolutely. A focus on who they can become rather on who they are. Um, and, and like you said, you know, we were just talking about earlier, there is, to some degree, yeah, we're all stupid. We're, as sheep, we are all stupid. But to another degree, we're not as stupid or people aren't as stupid as we think. And so when we treat them like that, like they're just dumb attendees and they don't know anything. So we need to control them. First of all, we're forgetting that we have that same, you know, sin in us. We have that same uh, need for God in us. But then also, like you said, we're not calling them up to who God made them to be. We're not seeing their potential. We're focused on where they're at right now. So that what a beautiful picture to paint. And Andrew, why do you think it is as leaders so often? And, you know, in our when we when we uh, talk right now, our missionary listeners are all different kinds of leaders. We have people leading churches. We have people leading ministries. We have people leading thousands of people, people leading a handful of people. So all different types of leadership. But why do you think it is we have this intense need to try and control people? Where does that come from? Nothing. I'm delivered from it. You ask my wife. <laughs> Just hey, like we it. all still struggle with that. Let's be real. <laughs> Me yeah. too. It's um, Jesus said in John 14, 23, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And my father will come and you'll experience his love and we'll come together and make our dwelling place with you here on earth. And so the, the whole thing is, is, if we love him, we will obey him and we won't have to control. But why don't we love him sometimes? Why do we try to control others? It's um, a lack of confidence in the goodness that he's really doing. Why do we have a lack of confidence? There's usually there's been a suspicion or hurt sowed in our heart back to Genesis 3. Did God really say? And and we're trying to put more discipline and make ourselves, you know, more holy. Uh, or, But it doesn't work that way. It works to getting our heart sealed mm -hmm. where we can get back to having confidence and having love. And a lot of people uh, leave the ministry for an accumulation of offenses. Just the little offenses that just build up. I mean, I'm, I met some beautiful missionaries that were called by God, and they left the mission field so angry. But it wasn't a big thing. It was just the accumulation of little offenses. And I've learned it. If we don't learn, as it says in Proverbs 19.11 and in 1 Peter 4, we'll overcome offenses. We're not going to make it in the ministry. But if we overcome offenses, it's to a greater honor, a greater glory. Or and, and then it says in First Peter, when people are criticizing you for the sake of my name, if you, um, it's so the the spirit of glory will rest on you. And in other words, one of the ways to grow in the anointing and the presence of God is to get over people offending you very quick, and you get offended in the ministry. I want to dig into that, Andrew. What do you feel like is a great way to get over a fence? Because it does. It happens. And it happens over and over and over and over and over again. What's a healthy way to work through that? It's just the, the, the brutal practice of radical forgiveness. Everybody remembers Karate Kid, right? Wax on, wax off, you know. And he was oh, yeah. just so ticked off. Why I have to do this such stupid movement? And then he, when he said, that's it, what's this all for? And he was going to attack him. And he blocked. He was so surprised it was built into his nature. And sometimes see, the, the forgiveness is not really deep in our nature. But every time we just do it for in the home, in the family, every time it was just, I had that revelation. This is an opportunity to grow in Christ. And then it becomes part of our nature more so. Okay, I'd love to ask a follow-up question to then that uh, to that then. So one thing that that I've seen many times in ministry is you'll see a pastor get really really hurt. Um, so it's a it's a big offense. It's something that is very painful. Yeah. 
And I'll see one of two things frequently. One, like you said, it's something that will sit and fester or get to the place where it pulls them out of ministry. It just it crushes them. Um, it makes them bitter or angry. So they end up kind of on the too sad or too mad side. Or I'll see them uh, forgive, but then put up these huge walls going forward. And so distancing themselves from people, you know, celebrating, well, we got, we, I'm glad those people are gone. They weren't supposed to be a part of our ministry. And it can almost build this callus that instead of being a healthy callus, like we use when we're exercising, turns into this rough, rough thing that they use to keep people out and only make friends with people who are like them. Yeah. Uh, so have you well. seen anything like that before? Oh, yeah, I'm, I, I've gone through some big hurt and almost didn't make it. Uh, but I, you know, if we do build up a wall, we might be protecting them ourselves from hurt, but we're also keeping ourselves from love. But here's what happened. Uh, I think it was about the third year of our church, and we were really growing. And then a couple of them, um, we had a big, we had two big divisions, one after the the other. We're talking about 40, 50 people leaving our church when we were at that time only around five or six hundred. Wow. And I was so hurt and, and afraid. I was. I thought every time the phone rang, is that someone else called me. Hey, Pastor, we just want to say we love you, but we're leaving. Um, we're going someplace where, but they had deeper teaching. I mean, you know, we've we've heard it all. Or, and, but you remember when uh, Cor- Korah rebelled against Moses and Aaron, and God mm-hmm. opened up the well, the ground and had Korah and his whole family for lunch. You think that kind of put an end to the to the a murmur, even to the problem? But no, they were saying, "No, Moses, he's too hard." Well, I've never really been accused of being too hard, but but it, it it was a fragrance. It was a bad air among the people. And the people are still questioning. I don't know about these guys. They just they don't seem the right. And then, so God said to um, Moses, tell Aaron to take his rod. And the other leaders of the tribes, everyone that take their rod of authority and write their initials. on. And I bet Aaron was thinking, Take the rod, okay. Now it's time to look, crack them on the head. Let's go. And they said, Now, what should we do with our rods? All 12 of you leaders of the tribes of Israel, just lay your rod overnight. And the rod that flourishes, that blossoms with fruit and flowers, will have the, the new authority. So you have to lay down our authority. Again, we have to, when God gives us a vision, he always let us die. So it's all based on the, the resurrection. And so I remember I was just, okay, Lord, if you haven't called me to this, I'm laying down my rod of authority. I, I'll, I'll leave. I'll, I'll, I don't know. I'll go back and sell insurance or something. But, um, but if I just gave it to the Lord in his, in his darkness and not tried to defend myself, the Lord calls us our rod and only Aaron's rod was, you know, was, had almonds and, and flowers and, and beautiful leaves. And they saw that. Yeah. It had a fragrance. Moses and Aaron, after that, they came out of that darkness with a deeper trust and authority. Not an authority to rule over them, but to lead them. And that we experienced that ourselves. We thought our authority was over. But when we just stayed quiet before the Lord, and Billy Graham said, I'll never try to defend myself. And God, if we're called, he will He will defend us in a beautiful way. Again, what we talked about in the beginning in Judges 9, with um, sweetness and joy and anointing. Laying down your authority. What are... Some other ways, Andrew, as you encountered more offenses, certainly you encountered more in the future, what were some other ways that you were able to keep yourself in that place of sweetness, like you mentioned, without erecting those walls to protect you? We get grumpy sometimes for lack of finance. To... <laughs> and uh, I mean, I remember when the church in the first year, 
I used to be part of counting with other people, the, you know, the offering. And I remember thinking, oh, it's just not enough. <laughs> I got to pray and release these people for being stingy. And then, you know, we've all experienced that. We've had some donors that said, hey, we're right behind you. And we find out that they're way, way behind them. <laughs> and, and so the temptation is that we get a grumpy, angry, how come, man, I'm sacrificed in everything. We get this, uh, you know, missionary uh, mentality, entitlement. I should, they should really, uh, this ain't right. And, um, and that's really common. But look what Jesus did. You know, when uh, they gave him that pathetic offering of a few pieces of fish and a few, you know, little pieces of, of bread. I mean, if I would have received that offering back then, I would have taken, this is pathetic, and just throw it on the floor. This is not going to do anything. But Jesus said, thank you. And he just looked up to heaven for this amazing offering. And that's what releases the multiplication. Andrew, can you say more about sweetness? That's a word that just keeps coming back to me as we're discussing. Because like you said, I, I'm i pretty sure sweetness is not in any leadership book I have ever read. And yet, what a beautiful characteristic to carry around. And it is something we certainly see in Jesus. How can leaders cultivate sweetness? Yeah, I love that question. In Exodus 15. Remember, they were all excited. They got, you know, through the Red Sea. It looks like blue sky and no problem. What a thrill it is to be called a, a child of God. And then they came to Mara, and they're so thirsty. And they drank the waters, and they were bitter. They're so angry. And we've all come to those times of Mara. Um, and, uh, and then God showed Moses, the priest, it's just sort of the tree. And the tree sweetened the waters. So, I mean, we see the tree is, you know, forecasting the crop. And it's just that where we have, and I'm, I'm, I've been a professional complainer. Again, ask my wife. She, she just peeked her head through the door. <laughs> and um, when there, there's still, there's contention, there's mistrust, there's people jockeying for position in the church. And instead of getting angry at the people, as leaders, we should just see that, oh, great, here's the opportunity I've been waiting for to teach the kingdom and serve it. Uh, you know, if you look at you know, Jesus, he didn't have a manual. Now we're going to learn um, uh, the lesson on how to be servants, to be great in the kingdom, and to be childlike. No, he just waited for them to have a discussion, and they were really angry at each other. And he butted in. And, and then one day he said, hey, let's have a lesson about faith. Great. But leave your books and your Bibles on the shore and I get in the boat. And then in the middle of the storm, I'd say we're going to have a lot of bitterness, a lot of contention in the church. And just look at his opportunity. That's where Jesus' university starts. I want to go back to... One of the things you talked about earlier, um, just that the, the offense, the control, I mean, you brought those up as really two huge things that leaders face. What advice would you give to missionaries who are struggling right now with feelings of offense or maybe some control issues? Or they feel like they're under control or are they recognizing that they're too controlling? Probably too controlling. I'm going to go with too controlling. Okay. To ask ourselves, why do I want to do this? Has Jesus really called us to be policemen or police women? For years, all of our meetings always had a church purpose. Uh, you know, this this meeting is about planning, about prayer, about Bible study. And I remember so often I was so worried that the people that were with us were going to leave us. And um, and that's well. The fear came true. They did leave, and now it's interesting. Now they they've come back. Now we're friends. We're having fun with them. So I just say, what are you afraid of losing control of? 
go ahead and lose it. That's it. What are you afraid of and lose it? Yeah. yeah, I mean, like you just said, with that whole offense thing and the control thing, fear is at the root of both of those. And so if we're trying to be more like Jesus and we're being controlled by fear as a leader, what kind of leader is that making us be? So I think that really begs the question, um, how self-aware are we? Are we even aware when we are being driven by fear instead of love? How can leaders cultivate a greater self-awareness in those areas? There's two ways. You can fast for 40 days or you can just ask your wife. There you go. Or your husband. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I would say, um, yeah, we have to really work on the culture of trust and uh, because trust is the currency of the kingdom of God. Now, we were, um, we were with a group very famous in the world. Uh, that was a, a church that was growing faster than any church in South America. And we were connected relationally. But, uh, and we would take up the 80 people to their conferences. And everything was on fear-based. You've got to produce this many results in your home groups. You have to make sure so many people are getting saved. And people were in competition, and they were lying about their facts, you know. And um, it just created an atmosphere. But God didn't put that. He put a supernatural love for me, for Medellin. He didn't put that structure in. But because it looked so successful, we bought into it for a while. Mm. But I started waking up, says, wait a minute, this isn't Jesus. I mean, it might be working for other people, but this isn't what he's called me to do. And so I'm a, it was the beginning of a worship service, and I was sitting struggling. I don't know if we should be with these people anymore. And this dear old lady who didn't know anything about what's going on, she came up and said, Pastor, I had a dream about you last night. I saw you sitting in a wheelchair, and another man was pushing you. And right there, I said, thank you, my, my dear sister. Thank you. That's it. I'm not going to let another man push me in the ministry. I'm going to stand up and walk with my Lord in peace. Because fear appears to produce fruit for, for a while. I mean, we can yeah, find it, ministries. It you can find people who are controlling. And it does. It appears to work. And it, but I think the real question, kind of like you're bringing up, Andrew, is what kind of fruit is it actually producing? Numbers? Numbers? And they won't stay. But what are those numbers actually believing and thinking and feeling? What kind of disciples are we actually producing? Or fear-based wow. disciples, which is, well, I'll tell you another story. At this time, when I think we had more of a fear atmosphere than a love atmosphere, you know, we've always said we're the church of contagious love. And we tried to be. But when we were going through this, and I was really stressed out, I was stuck on traffic over the bridge. And I start just praying, God, send everybody in this town to our church. And uh, and then the Lord really spoke to me. Why would you want everybody in Medellin to go to your church? To be all stressed out and fearful just like you are? Oh, he got you there. <laughs> he got me. And uh, I, I, I think another thing, too. Oh, I was didn't make this point before. But we should really have a high value on friendship in the, in the leadership. This uh, a couple of pastors came down from this big, growing, kind of a controlling church, and they 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 were with us about four days observing how we do our church to give advice and everything. And he said, "You know what you got on here? Just wonderful and it's exciting. There's a joy among you." But then he pulled me aside and said, "You need to be separate from." Me. Or they won't respect your anointing. You're too close. You're too friendly with me. I, I said, well, I'm not going to do it that way. We enjoy our friendship. And so what are some of the ways that you have been able to balance that? Uh, having friendships and also being able to still influence people, you know, as pastor, well, as, as missionary, who God's called you to be. The tendency that people want to put you on a pedestal. And we just have to constantly say, I'm sorry, I'm just not going to do that. 
I'm getting down to where you are and let's follow Jesus together. Um, we've, we've had hard times, you know, we've had to learn how to confront and be quick to resolve conflict. Don't let it linger. And th that way, uh, you know, it's interesting. We need the blood of Jesus that cleanse us and the clean cleanse the atmosphere of ministry and the atmosphere of the church. But in 1 John 1, 7, it says, as we walk in the, in the light, as he's in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Well, the blood doesn't work in the dark. Only as we just trust the light, say, hey, let's just hey, let's talk about this, what we feel between us, what's going on. And in the light, well, we find out things, boy, yeah, they're thrown, but the blood cleanses us. And we have fellowship with one another then. Andrew, for, for missionaries and leaders who are listening right now, who are really resonating with some of the things that you shared, whether it be offense and their reaction to it, whether it be that desire to control, and they're feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit, like, I, I, it's, I need to make a change. I'm being motivated by fear. What is one step that they can take to start moving in that direction right now? I would say get alone or you know, get alone with your, your, your wife or husband and, um, and ask the question, what's the hurt behind the fear? What's going on here? And here are some big questions. What do I want to do for the rest of my life? Um, I just uh, pulled up a letter that my dear friend, Randy McMillan, I'm Nick Millen, I'm micro, he's micro, he died about 11 years ago. It was the supernatural connection with Randy that brought me to um, Columbia, but he wrote me a letter when I went through that time of uh, being so hurt. I just went quit the ministry, I didn't want to talk to anybody, and um and then he said, Dear Andrew, it's, it's a short letter. Your letter touched my, my heart. I know the pain is like salt in a wound. We know that we have a soul. We don't know that we have a soul until it hurts. So get alone with our hurts and try to say, okay, what's going on here? And then he said, pray according to the law of restitution of the Old Testament where God commands what was stolen from us with the, you know, come back five times. Uh, it channels the power of pain, making your tears for the latter rain that's coming to your church. It seems clear that God can never use a man powerfully until he has hurt him deeply. So as to protect him, so to protect him so he'll never touch his glory. In this case, you're the man. And then you probably ask, what, why? And then uh, and the God has swore that no man can touch his glory and live. So it's necessary that God breaks our hearts to protect us from greatly exalting ourselves beyond the measure of glory that we can handle. Um, let's see. So he's bringing you to a higher dimension. And um, he's going to bring you to a magnitude of ministry would make an ordinary man intoxicated with pride and self-exaltation. Um, so that's a beautiful um, letter. Man, God can never use us until he deeply breaks us. Then going back to Jesus taking the bread. Henry Nowen, right there. Yes, yeah, that's the point. Huh? He talks about that. We're wounded healers. Yes. Mm -hmm. We are. We are taken. We are broken. We are we're blessed, broken, and given. Yes. Right there. And we're given oh, that's away. that's so good. But also, I like, I like, um, one day I'll flip John or not from, you know, Catch Star Toronto. And uh, we went up to pick up his luggage in, in the airport and never arrived. So he was without his own shirts and everything for three days. I'd be grumpy. So they said, hey, your luggage is here. Went up with John. We got there. So, oh, we made a mistake. It's not here yet. And John just responded, oh, okay. Thanks. Well, just let me know. And I was just being a how can you be that calm? And he says, I don't know, Andrew. I would just, I just think, is this important in a hundred years? And so even think, 
It's our ministry. Where will it be in a hundred years from now? The fruit of it. Hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of the churches that are today won't even, well, I think Jesus will be here before that. Well, a lot of the churches that are going on today won't even exist in 50 years. But the fruit um, of the transformation of Jesus and people's lives will be passed down through family. Yes. And Andrew, uh, thinking about younger leaders who are going to be stepping into ministry or maybe young missionaries who've recently gotten on the field, what are some things they can do to prevent themselves from getting to this point? And that's kind of a tongue in cheek question in that they're going to have their hiccups and their bumps. They're going to be offended. I'm not asking you to tell them how they can avoid all the difficulties in life. But what is one thing young leaders can do to prepare themselves now for some of the things they're going to face? Yeah, I like where the book of Jeremiah, God says, I hit you in the palm of my hand. Um, and then I think it's in John, was this, uh, Jeremiah 15. You sat alone because my hand was heavy upon you. There's just that, that time before we hit the field that God will just give us really lonely weekends. Um, and we really sense alone. And uh, I think God permits it. All of a sudden, everybody around it might have been excited about our calling aren't anymore because he really he just really wants to form his he does his best work in the dark uh like abigail just born two weeks ago we didn't couldn't see her for those nine months that's when god was doing his best work inside um sarah's belly and but then uh the king really does right on our heart his will his law and um i think before we're in a rush to go with the romantic view because the romance wears off pretty quick i'm a missionary i'm the indiana jones um but deep love will not i think you really most important is really get god guiding on the geographical area or could be a you know or a group of people businessmen or or uh, different kind of uh, group, but kind of a geographical area and a people. And I remember that old song, Here I am, Lord, I hear your people crying in the night. Right now, for the new missionaries that are getting ready to go, there are people crying out to God. And they're almost the point of suicide. And you're the answer that God sent you. It's funny when, when God said to Moses, I'm coming down because I hear the cry of my people. Oh, good. I'm glad you're coming. Yeah, well, I am, but I'm sending you. Okay, two will never be completely adequate. But, uh, I mean, he makes us adequate. And, but I think it's so important to get God's vision, not just to go to a place and hang around and see what happens. What do you see? Let God start putting images of what you see. I, we saw this church of thousands. You know, we're seeing up to 200 people come to Christ in the weekend, and we're planting a lot of other healthy churches. Um, but we saw it first before it existed. And when, when you get God's vision, like Abraham did, God will release resources and wisdom that you didn't have to fulfill it. Right, but then, then again, like we said, don't let that vision die. And then it'll, it'll resurrect it. Um, and then going back to Randy, uh, I remember talking to him when we were, we were going on the way to Cali to, to join Randy. So, oh, Randy, by the way, does the church there pay me a salary? He went, oh, no, brother, you got to come by faith. But I guarantee you one thing. <laughs> God will take better care of you than the deacons did in the Baptist church. <laughs> hey, we love the Baptist church. Well, that's sure been true. Oh, I can't thank you enough, Andrew, for coming on and sharing with us today. It's just, it's a blessing and an inspiration to see a leader who is still walking the faithful walk, who has invested into 
their own relationship with God, with their family, with people around them to keep themselves healthy. So thank you for being that example for all of us and just for taking the time to share some of the things the Lord's done in you. Well, one last thing, just one last thing, because I had one of my joys is seeing uh, young people discover their call. You know, the two great moments in your life, you're born again, and then you're, you find your destiny, you're, you're, you find out why you're here. And to really create that space that people discover the greatness of their calling. And it's what, it's, it's, uh, what, it's what God is calling you to, to the new missionaries. If what he's showing you is within your capability, it's not God. That's a great note to end on, and it couldn't be more true. Couldn't be more true. Well, Andrew, thank you to you and Kathy again for the work that you do. We're so blessed to have you as modern-day missionaries. You're part of this this tribe, and uh, we love and appreciate you and all the work that you do there in Medellin. And thank you again for being with us today. Hey, and, and give Marvin and Dan our love. We, we love you guys. We love the, the healthiness, the flexibility. You Modern-day mission is a new wineskin. Thanks, Andrew.